I love um, that last verse we just sang. Now your grace is always with me, and my heart has found a home. It's one thing to sing it. It's an entirely different perspective to believe it. And then it's even another step to believe it to the point that I live in the reality of that truth. Because is there any circumstance, is there any difficulty, is there any turmoil, is there any chaos that can change the fact that his grace is always with us and my heart has found a home? Is there anything that changes that? No. So the challenge for us is to live in the attitude of that truth that we profess we believe. That, that last statement is the reality of living in the fullness of the Christian life. The fullness of the Christian life is not getting more of the Holy Spirit. At the moment that you become a Christian, that you and what that means, let me just define in case you're new here. It doesn't mean being a member of New Hope or some Baptist church or some Assembly of God church or some large church. It means one thing and one thing only. It means that I realize I at some point in my life have a need. And that need is there because of a problem with sin. And sin is not to be defined as lying or stealing or adultery. Those are the fruits of sin. Sin is independence from God, period. You may live a great moral life, but you were doing it all on your own. You're doing it out of human effort and exercise. That's living independent from God. No confidence or trust in him. And so you come to a place in your life where you say, I don't want to live like that anymore. The story of Christmas and the story of Easter is the message of God. God coming to us. To forgive us of our sin, our rebellion and independence from him. And to choose repentance is an about face. I have lived my life this way saying these are things that are right in my own eyes. And now I'm going to walk this way because these are the things that are right in the eyes of God. And that's possible to me through grace, not works or effort. And so once I come to that moment in time in my life, like the three, little, three young ladies last week in the baptistry got saved when they were little girls in Heartland Camp. And the way it is for you and for you and for me today, the, the perspective of the Christian life is to now live in the reality of the truth that we say we believe in. That's a growing process as we learn more and more of God's truth that's why it's so important that we don't become stagnant in our learning about God's Word. It's why we don't become stagnant in applying God's Word in every situation in our life. It's why we don't get careless in our life. It's because as we do, then we progressively move farther and farther from the reality of, now your grace is always with me and my heart has found a home. Well... That wasn't part of any of today's sermon. <laughs> so let's jump into today's. I read that a man wrote once, anyone who doesn't have high blood pressure these days simply isn't paying attention. <laughs> Sounds kind of true, doesn't it? The way life is going today. Uh, I, I, most of you know, you've heard me say this from up here. I've, I've written it on the rare occasions that I write something and post on Facebook. And that's usually because either somebody has told me I should do something or God has given me a deep sense that it's time to post something. I have a Facebook page. I rarely go there. Uh, if you all send questions to me on Facebook, you probably think I am the rudest man around because rarely do I ever answer anything. If you you send me a message through Messenger on Facebook, I probably have not seen it. Sometimes I may have seen it, but I don't open it because I cannot tell you how many people have sent me messages saying, as a result of Messenger, my account has been hacked. Please don't. So I just don't open up whatever you send me. So if, if that's happened to you, it was unintentionally intentional. 
okay? So if you want to commit, pick up a telephone, all right? Send me a text. Uh, I do answer those usually pretty, pretty quickly. But this week on the church Facebook, uh, the gentleman who does our announcements and keeps our, f- our church Facebook page looking fresh and hopefully inviting to folks who are trolling, looking for something New Hope might be able to help, uh, he said, Tim, you need to give a brief Thanksgiving message for me to post on Facebook this week. So we did, and I'm assuming he did, because I didn't go to see if it was there. Is it there? Did anybody see it? Oh, it's so good. (laughs) I went through that whole apology for nothing because none of you read Facebook, obviously. So, but anyway, it's a good thing because now none of this will be review for you at all. Actually, it's just a short thing that I, I wanted to highlight that I did do on Facebook. Uh... I did it, and I'll never see it. So, But anyway, uh, I was doing research in preparation for this Sunday sermon, and I was looking up, you know, what do we know about gratitude? And wow, I found out that there are hundreds of research studies that have been done on the attitude of gratitude. I did not want to read hundreds of research papers. So I found an article that summarized 40 research studies on gratitude, And they kind of broke it down. And they said, out of those 40 studies, they called out 31 benefits of a grateful life. Now, this is not biblical. This was not coming from a church. This is, these are like Harvard, all right, research at Yale. These are various independent research institutes looking at the subject of gratitude and thankfulness. So, uh, I called out of their 31, 14, and I just want to highlight those. Uh, these are benefits that come to any life that chooses to function more out of thankfulness and gratitude than out of frustration and anxiety. I don't know about you, I like these things. Uh, it falls into five categories of our life. Number one, personality-wise. How does gratitude impact our personality? It tells us we will be more optimistic if we're grateful. I want you to understand the order there. It's not by being optimistic that we will be grateful. It is by being grateful we will become more optimistic. We will also become less materialistic. As we are grateful for what we already have, we become less materialistic about the things that we don't yet have. And we also have an interest more in spiritual matters when we are grateful. In the area of our physical health, the research says that we sleep better and have more energy when we are grateful rather than unappreciative. In the area of our emotional well-being, the research indicates we will have more resilience, happier memories, and we will live life more relaxed. Socially, gratitude impacts us because we are more friendly I don't know about you, but if you have any friends or family members who every time you're with them, they complain all the time, you choose usually not to hang out with them very often. And you never ask them, how you doing? (laughs) Socially, if you're married, your marriage becomes better if you're grateful. And if you're not married, then the next one hopefully applies is you'll have deeper relationships and friendships because you're grateful. Career. Your career will have enhanced networking. Of course, people want to hang out with grateful people. People who say, hey, thank you for a job well done. Hey, thank you for helping me on that assignment. Hey, thank you for that, uh, uh, thank you for that connection that you made me. Networking gets better. We have improved decision making when we're grateful. And there is increased productivity when we are grateful. Now, that's just 14 to 31, but folks, do I need to persuade you that gratitude is really a healthy thing? If that wasn't enough for you, let me give you a biblical mandate. The Apostle Paul addresses this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, when he says, whatever you do, what's left out of whatever? Absolutely nothing. Whatever you do in word, So conversation or deed, action, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How? Giving thanks through him who God is our Father. Wow. So before you say anything, give thanks through God the Father. 
If you give thanks to God the Father before you say it, you might say what you're about to say a little differently. You might even choose not to say what you were about to say at all because you can't say it just after you've given thanks to God the Father. Now, we've been in the book of Philippians, and we're back there again a little bit today. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says this. Your attitude, our attitude as believers, those who say we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So I have a big question for you. It's a two-word question. Any idea what the question is? Is it? There's my question. Philippians 2.5 says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Is it? If you want to say, oh, Tim, I, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Okay, flip over a page in the book of Philippians to chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Paul sort of describes it for us. He says it this way, rejoice in the Lord always. So what time can you take off from rejoicing? Never. This doesn't say, well, the times are good. Rejoice. This says, rejoice in the Lord always. High watermark, low watermark, rejoice in who he is because he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In this world, it is like this. In his relationship, it is always like this. And if you don't believe him the first time, say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Wow. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is here. Do not be anxious about what? It, what's left out? Nothing. But in everything, all things, by prayer and petition, with what? Thanksgiving. Present your request to God. Uh, that's a prayer of faith. God, thank you that in this cancer treatment that I am going through, you are big enough for me and whatever you have in store, I will trust you with it. In this marital challenge that I'm going through, thank you, God, that I cannot see the end from the beginning, but thank you very much. You are big enough to reveal yourself in and through my life. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. See, you don't have to understand what you believe. But you do need to believe. See, sometimes we want to be able to, somebody's backing up. I've told you many times I don't understand electricity. It kind of boggles my mind. Oh, I understand there's a positive and a negative, but pff, that's only because somebody told me that. How, how do you look at one line except for the fact it's got one color, and you look at another line that's got another color? How in the world do you know this one's positive and this one's negative? Okay? Well, why would I do that? Okay? I don't need to do that to know it's going to hurt me. All right? I've watched other people do that. Okay? Um, I don't fully understand it. Here's what I do know is the lights underneath the bridge building didn't work for about two weeks. Now, I'm not here a lot at night, so I didn't know it. And then finally we figured it out. Okay, they had been coming on. So we called for an expert to come over. All right, we show them a problem. Well, did you check the breaker? Well, I'm smart enough to check the breaker box on some days. And then I had to check. Nope, breaker wasn't tripped. They got a little sensor out on the end because it comes on when it gets dark and it turns off when it gets light. So probably the sensor's gone back. I knew we could not have 16 light bulbs out at the same time. That part I said, that would be really, really unusual. All right, so it's probably in the sensor. Okay, we're good. While they're looking at that and asking, all of a sudden I realized, you know what? Somewhere in this building there is a switch. And so I went in the hallway, going to the bathrooms in there, and there's a cover, and there's three switches, and one of them, we put a cover over the switch, so you can't, you got to intentionally stick your finger inside that cover and move the switch, and if that wasn't enough, not for anybody to touch the switch, we wrote a message, and it's taped to the side of the switch that says, do not change the position of this switch. Guess what? Somebody stuck their finger in there and changed the position of that switch. And as soon as we flipped that switch on, the light came on. And I'm going to suggest to you that the reason the light of Christ and his grace does not sometimes shine in your daily life and my daily life is because we stuck our finger and we changed the switch. We made a choice 
to not live in the attitude of thankfulness in this relationship that we have with God. We chose to look at the circumstances, our desires, and our own personal wants rather than the will of God for our life. A relationship that has learned to believe Romans 8.28 is the way you and I are to live. All things work together for good to those who love God and trust his purpose in our life. We do not have to understand how that works, but we must believe it to live in the reality of the will of God in our life. Again, another trite and maybe foolish expression of I don't have to understand it, but I have to believe it is a, a quote my grandfather used to say. I don't understand how an old black cow can, give white, can eat green grass, give white milk, and turn yellow butter, but I believe it every single day. You and I don't have to believe how these things function, but we do have to believe that God is truthful in what he says. There are five important steps to replace a careful life. I'm playing a word game here. No, I didn't say a carefree life. Most of us have our lives filled with too many cares, too many frustrations, problems, needs, or wants that weigh us down and burden us in life. And there are five steps to replace a careful life. We need to replace them. I'll highlight this real quick and then go back and say a word or two about each one. You see, we need to replace careful with graceful. We need to replace careful with prayerful. We need to replace careful with openness. We need to replace careful with thankfulness. And we need to replace careful with peacefulness. Those are the five things that make a difference. Number one, the first step in overcoming anxiety and careful living for a Christian is to live by grace. Even though a born-again believer has the Spirit of God living inside of them, it does not mean that God always takes away all the difficulties and problems of this world. But in the midst of those problems, we must believe in the ongoing presence of Christ in each of our heart. We're not immune or insensitive to the trouble of others or even to ourselves. But we to our experience this unspeakable joy knowing that God will return one day and make all things right. When we believe that, anxious thoughts soon melt away when we remember that he who raised us from spiritual death, granted us life, will never leave us nor forsake us. Step number two, replacing anxiety with prayerfulness. The scripture says, do not be anxious about anything but in everything with prayer and petition. Share it with God. The antidote for anxiety is prayer. But when we pray, we have to believe in the one to whom we are praying over. Prayer is not apathy or inaction. Nor should it be the last resort for us to escape tribulations, but it is the passionate, persistent integration of human hopes and fears in the redemptive purpose of God in Christ. Anxiety dissipates the moment that we trust his care is more sufficient to either endure or escape the most difficult or turbulent seas. Let me stop. I forgot to tell you about a principle in mathematics that connects to all this. And in mathematics, and I didn't learn this in math class, because once I got past uh, long division and multiplication, I pretty well checked out of mathematics. Okay? Figured that was all I was ever going to need. But in mathematics, there is, this, uh, there is this theory called the butterfly effect. Any of you math students ever heard of that? I got a few heads nodding out there, all right? Um, now, I thought about reading to you the scientific definition of the butterfly effect, but I couldn't pronounce some of the words, so I found somebody who did a thing for mathematics for dummies. And so let me give you that definition because I could handle that one. Here's what it boils down to. It's the idea that a single, seemingly insignificant change or event can have a profound, large-scale effect later on. 
And the most common example they use to illustrate this theory is the butterfly flapping its wings, which produces airwaves that intensify over time to such a degree that it could become a huge storm or a hurricane. I've never seen a butterfly create a hurricane. But they tell me it's a theory. It's really interesting to me, though, how the principle is that the smallest things can have the biggest impact. Think of that moment you invited Jesus Christ in your life. Did it have a big impact on you? Yeah, probably. If it didn't, oh, I hate to say this. Maybe you didn't get saved. Because it ought to radically change who we are. It's really interesting how this happens. Paul is making his, Paul to the Corinthians in chapter 9 of his first epistle is going to ask them to take up an offering for the, the folks in the, the, the church in Jerusalem. And it was an important offering because of God's activity in Jerusalem was going really, really well. The church was exploded and they needed some help. And, and Paul is saying your ability to show gratitude to God for the work of grace in your own life becomes the way by which others can experience God's grace firsthand. When we have received God's grace in our life and then we share God's grace with others through a generous heart, we are creating a butterfly effect. And what was said about the first century church is they turned the world upside down. I don't know about you, but maybe we need to pray for a butterfly effect in the 21st century. Because the world needs to be turned upside down again. So these steps are important so that the butterfly effect can impact our world through the church. Step three is telling God everything. That's the openness. I, I, those of you who are married, I, I doubt if it's true for any of you, but occasionally I get couples who come to my office for a little, little tune-up work. And one of the biggest complaints that I hear is, you know, they just don't talk to me. Now that's probably never happened in your marriage, right? God, I think, has said that a lot about his relationship with us. We just don't open up to him. This passage says, in every situation, make our requests known to God. There is no situation too small. There is certainly no situation too big. And there's no situation in the middle that shouldn't be given to him. It all should be shared with him. Step number four, have a thankful heart. The kind of prayers that eliminate anxiety are those that is given out of a cheerful, joy-filled, grateful heart. I believe every prayer should not start until we have spent time reflecting on all the times that God has blessed us and his gifts that we have actively seen in our life. If you had seen that Facebook thing, if it's on Facebook or if it shows up today or tomorrow, uh, one suggestion I make on that little short blurb is this. Why don't you start for 30 days a journal of gratitude? That's not a new idea. I stole it from somebody else. But why don't you start just for 30 or 31 days, start your morning. First thing you do in the morning, have a pad and pencil, all right, or a little, little journal and a pencil right by your nightstand. The first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is before I do anything today, I'm going to write down three things I'm grateful for. Before I whine, complain, or say something bad about what I got to do today or what happened yesterday, what are three things I am grateful for? And you say, Tim, that's about all there is on my list. Then write them down every day. Start your day thanking God for those things. And then number five, if we do all those things, we will experience the peace of God in our life. Verse, verse seven says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. See, I don't have to understand it. But it will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Once we learn how to live by grace, and are taking everything to God in prayer with thanksgiving, the final step is to have our anxiety replaced with his peace. It doesn't mean our circumstances have changed one little bit. But it means we've learned how to live greater with our trust in God. Here's what I know about most folks who have problems with being anxious is your anxiousness only goes away when the problem goes away. And if another problem doesn't show up pretty soon, you become anxious about not having a problem to be anxious over. <laughs> I, 
And some of you are identifying very quickly with that. That, 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 that that's, that's an attitude that the evil one uses as a trick to keep us from really trusting God. I got to see it. I got to experience it before it's mine. And there are times we must just make steps of faith. It, it has to do more with about how much we believe God is who God says he is than who we want God to be. That is the difference. Let me wrap this up. Let's see here. I wanted to tell you what, um, I wanted to tell you about the Harvard result. Oh, no, it's a Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal, um, about three years ago, did an article very similar to the one of the 40 research groups that I opened up with. And the Wall Street Journal summarized the research they had looked at like this. Adults who frequently feel grateful have more energy, more optimism, more social connection, more happiness than those who do not. They are also less likely to be depressed, envious, greedy, or alcoholics. They earn more money, sleep more soundly, exercise more regularly, and have the greatest resistance of viral infections. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It confirms the research that I just found out. But here's the way the article ends and why I wanted to share it with you. The key to benefiting from an attitude of gratitude is to not leave it on the Thanksgiving table. This is not a one-time thing. This is an everyday thing. It is the butterfly effect. Every day, making multiple choices throughout the day that I am going to live in the reality of God's truth rather than my own experience. And when we do that... Others will notice the reason for the hope that we have living in us. Remember what Peter said? I don't know whose pen that is, but Peter said, be ready to give every man an answer, every person an answer for the hope that lives within you. When do people see hope in your life? Do they see it when you got the raise and the promotion? Do they see it when you're married to the best spouse in the world? Do they see it when your kids are on the honor roll and never ever get in trouble? Folks see hope in your world during your seasons of trouble. That's when hope shines. And that's when we have the opportunity to share hope with someone else. Let me close. There was a man who served as a medical missionary for many years in India. He served in an area where all of the people developed progressive blindness. People were born with healthy vision, but there was something in that area that caused people to lose their sight as they matured. Well, this medical missionary, after being there a while and studying the problem, developed a surgery that would stop the progressive blindness. So people came to him, and he performed his surgery on them, and they would leave there realizing that they now would never become blind. But now they are going to be able to see for the rest of their lives. The people in this area that the missionary did the surgeries on never once said thank you to this missionary. And the reason they never said thank you is because that word did not exist in their dialect. Instead, they spoke a word that meant, I will tell your name. So wherever they went, they would tell the name of the missionary who cured their blindness. They had received something so wonderful that they eagerly proclaimed it to anybody who would listen. You and I were born spiritually dead. And guess what will happen to all of us one day in the future? We will physically die. Just as all those folks born in that area would become progressively blind, you and I progressively reach deadness. Doesn't that sound wonderful? The Bible says it this way, outwardly we are wasting away. But the Lord Jesus came, that's the message of Christmas and Easter, the Lord Jesus came to cure our deadness. There's a spiritual surgery, it's called salvation. And you and I never have to be afraid of dying ever again. And when we have received that truth and we've experienced that spiritual surgery, we ought to be able to tell the name of the one who did this for us, to any who will listen. 
Are you grateful for God's forgiveness in your life? Then why don't you tell somebody? Maybe you're unsure whether you have received the forgiveness of God. But in this closing prayer, why don't you make sure? No fancy prayer, no special formula. You don't even have to come forward. I'm not even going to make you raise your hand today. I'm just going to ask you to simply say, God, I want to make sure. I don't want to be independent from you anymore. I want you to come live in my life. Forgive me of all that I've said and done. And Father, enable me progressively to learn how to live in an attitude of gratitude. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all the research that has been done on the subject of thankfulness and gratitude. All this research has done is support biblical truth. Every bit of it. The things that it talks about are the things that you tell us in your word you are prepared to accomplish in our lives if we will let you. And the way we let you is by saying, God, here is my need. Thank you very much for what you choose to do with it. I know you're big enough for the task. You, you will be my strength when I am weak. You will be my hope when I am discouraged. You will be my peace when I am anxious. Father, thank you for this wonderful exchange. Our sinfulness for your righteousness. Your goodness for our wickedness, your sufficiency for our inadequacy. Thank you for hearing our prayers today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day. 